Esther does not need an introduction. She's a professor at MIT in the economics department. And uh, she's also the co-founder and the co-director of uh, JPAL, uh, the uh, Poverty Action Lab, which has done a lot of interesting work in developing countries for the poor. Esther's own work is focused on uh, the economics of poor communities and the uh, institution of uh, policies for improving the, the quality of their lives. Uh, she's also done a lot of other work in education and governance and, uh, and, and other areas. I have a list of all her awards, but I will not mention them. That would take uh, too much uh, time of her um, uh, presentation, but she's certainly been recognized not only by the economics community, but also by the social science community at large. Um, she's also written an influential book um, uh, with uh, Benerjee, The Spider of Poor Economics, Radical Rethinking of the Way to Fight Global Poverty. That book has been cited and, and, and awarded many awards, but also been translated to 17 different languages. Uh, we're very pleased to have you, Esther. Thank you very much. So let me first check that everybody can hear me. I'm not amplified. Excellent. Uh, second, uh, my apologies. Uh, this is not going to be a very highly technical lecture at all. I'm going to try and describe a little bit what I do, what we do in JPAL, and uh, uh, where it has come to and what's in the future, etc. So it's going to be more of a like, sort of big picture, uh, trying to explain uh, uh, what we have been doing and where it is going, maybe. Uh, but I'll go through a lot of examples. Uh, so the main tool of my work is uh, randomized controlled trials. I probably don't need to explain to you what a randomized controlled trial is. Uh, but it really involves, uh, in all the work we are doing, which is work on, mostly on social policy uh, uh, for the poor. Most of my work is in developing countries, but there are some work in I also do some work in developed countries, and so do many other. It's uh, at the basic core of it is some randomization device. You have a study sample that it's divided into a control group and any number of study groups. Uh, so randomized control trial, it's very important. Doesn't mean any which way, it means random, random, where there is like a coin somewhere or a randomization tool in a, in a computer. Uh, so there are various ways you can do that. Uh, you could either just uh, take your sample of eligible people, say schools where you are interested in introducing a new curriculum to teach preschool mathematics to students. Uh, you have 200 preschools, which you calculated is roughly what you need for sample size, and you randomly select 100 of them, and you introduce the curriculum. And at the end of the study, you collect a bunch of measures on mathematics knowledge in both types of schools. So that's the simplest way to do it. Uh, but uh, it's not always possible to go with the simplest way to do it because uh, sometimes it's just not practical to do this pure randomization. So there are any number of other ways to introduce randomization in the field. And I'm going to uh, talk about them very briefly without going into the details, just to show you sort of the, the creativity that sometimes is needed in order to introduce randomization where you would not think you could necessarily do it. Uh, one way you can do that is what we call randomization in the bubble, or randomization around the cutoff, is where uh, you're working with a partner, for example, um, a bank. And you want to say, hey, it wouldn't be nice to randomly give credit to people, so we would know whether getting credit is a good thing or a bad thing. And the bank is looking at you like, you must be joking. We don't actually randomly assign credit, uh, so it's not going to be possible. So you can say, well, yes, but what do you use? You use, uh, for example, a credit scoring method. So you score whatever you know about the person and rank. And the truth is that wherever you put the cutoff has a certain arbitrariness to it. And so you could say, well, let's, uh, instead of using the sort of the 45 cutoff, which would be your cutoff that you then normally use it in business as usual, you say, let's enlarge a little bit both ways. Let's have an intermediate zone between a score of 30 and 60. And in that zone, we're going to randomize who gets credit and who doesn't get credit. And by the way, it doesn't even need to be random, random with equal probability on both sides. You could say, well, I'm going to randomize uh, with a higher probability for the people who would normally get it, such that very few people would be denied the credit, and with a lower probability for people who would otherwise not get it. Uh, so you don't get too many people who are likely to default on you, et cetera. 
So that is something which is uh, actually quite palatable because in many cases, the banks actually do not know how well their scoring method does. And that allows them to get a sense of whether, for example, people who are to the right of the cutoff are more likely to default than people to the left of the cutoff they're normally using. So that's one method that is also that can be used. Another method very, very commonly as, you, as programs get rolled out, you try and work to randomize the phasing of the program. So the idea is not that you're going to give the program in the 200 preschools. Out of the 200 preschools you have, you're not giving it to 100 and then never again to the other ones. But instead, you are doing first 200 schools and then supposing it's not a disaster, you're going to scale up the program to the next 100. So this is something I would say at the beginning of randomized control trials, this is pretty much what everybody did because they had, there was the, the view that it's the only thing that's really feasible uh, practically, otherwise people would be upset, etc. The truth is that it, it's not an ideal design because it has a number of issues. The people who are not treated yet anticipate to be treated in the future, potentially, that can change their behavior and therefore you don't exactly know what you're measuring. Uh, and then it turns out that it's actually usually fine to just randomize. So this is something that, that we do less of, but that's an option. And another option that, <coughs> that is often used either on purpose or just happens is where you don't really randomize the treatment, but you randomize something that makes the treatment more likely. Uh, so the equivalent would be this knockdown versus knockout uh, in biology where it's not that I will randomize you into treatment versus comparison, but I will randomize you into something that, is make it, that makes it more likely you're treated. So for example, uh, in a recent example, it's, um, it's a program where uh, they made iron peel available to adolescents in a, in a village. So a lot of, in Peru, poor, uh, poor people, uh, uh, poor adolescents are often anemic, a large fraction of the kids are anemic, and that maybe that's hypothesized to be bad for their school performance, etc. So many, the, the WHO um, recommends that pe there should be iron distributed to kids, uh, to adolescent kids, and some schools do it, some programs have it, but there's a huge problem with take up, where the kids actually aren't so interested in taking the pill and they just don't do it. So what they did here is that they took a number of communities, they made the, the iron pills available at the health centers, and then they went to schools and they randomly selected some kids and showed them like lots and lots of video about how bad anemia is and how the pills are available right there at the center and you should go get them. So when you do that, you don't get 0% take up in the comparison group because some of the, some of the kids that didn't see the video still found their way to the center, let's say because of friends of theirs that see the video or their parents told them to do it or whatnot. So let's say it's hypothetical, but 20% of the kids in the comparison group who didn't see the video still access the pill. Uh, and conversely, it's not that the deep video convinces everybody, uh, but it convinces some people. So 45% of the kids who see the video take the pill. So it creates a difference. The, the randomization creates a difference in the probability to have seen the video. Of course, the only thing that is randomized is the is having seen the video. So the, the only thing that is randomized is having seen the video, but you can use that in order, you can use this exogenous variation, this randomized variation to infer what's the impact of the, of the um, actually taking the iron is. What this involves simply is to compare the treatment and the, the video, no video group, and divide that by the difference in probability in taking the pill. So basically here, it's, you divide by 25% or you scale up by, by a factor of four to your, uh, your randomized difference, so your, your intention to treat, you scale it up by a factor of four and you get the effect of getting the pills. And there's the extra assumption, which is not innocuous, that the, seeing the video itself doesn't have a direct impact on anemia, say, or behavior through other channels. So you'd have to check that, but this is actually checkable in some ways. And and you, in this way you make progress. So a lot of experiments are a little bit like this, if only because not, it's not always possible to convince people to, take, to, to stay in the group where you assign them. Uh, so sometimes it's involuntary that it's like that, and sometimes it's on purpose. That's powerful because it means you can evaluate even programs that are rolled out nationwide, 
for example, a pension program, because in a lot of cases, a lot of people just don't take it up. So if you can boost the take up, you can, you can evaluate the impact of those programs as well, without manipulating the existence of the program in, a, in and of itself. So in our work, we are interested in causal effects of a policy or an intervention, or sometimes someone's characteristic, for example, their education, on an outcome or a series of outcomes people's earnings or people's happiness or whatever it is you want that is you specify before getting started. I should say at the outset that we are not interested in the causes of effect, but we are interested in the effect of cause. I mean, it's not that I'm uninterested in the, what causes various things. It's just that I think it's a bit hard for me. What I can do is to look at what type of effect a given cause produces. In other words, I'm never trying to look at the like, what is the entire model of someone's behavior. I'm always interested in looking at what's the effect of a particular cause that is in principle manipulable, that you can change. So what happens if I do this rather than that? What happens if I am like this rather than like that? And uh, uh, isolating the rest. So it's a pretty severe limitation maybe, but that's, that's what it is. Uh, I find the rest hard to think about. So. So uh, randomization is a natural way to provide a credible counterfactual of what would have happened if I had done manipulation A versus manipulation B. Uh, so in the Rubin uh, causal framework notation, basically the, what randomization gives us, if treatment T is randomly assigned, then the potential outcome for someone who doesn't, who, uh, the potential outcome not treated for someone who get the treatment is equal to the potential outcome not treated for someone who gets the treatment, who doesn't get the treatment. In other words, in the absence of the treatment, the treated and the untreated population would have had similar outcomes. Okay? Which means that when I take the simple difference between treated and control, if T is the randomly assigned uh, treatment, uh, I, I recover the causal effect for, the, for this, on average, this population. So in that sense, randomization ensures internal validity, so that it ensures that the comparison between outcomes gives me a handle on the causal effect. Now, of course, if I had an encouragement design type setting, that's not necessarily what I really care about, so I need to do some manipulation to go back to the effect of the actual thing that I'm interested about, and the treatment is just a device that pushes it, dials it up or down a little bit, so there's some extra little work that's needed, but that's all, you know, conceptually easy. Uh, so one question you might ask is why bother? You know, why do you do that? Uh, you, one you could ask, especially if you're not economist or even more if you are economist sometimes, is uh, well, but why do you need to? Why do you need to just be so? Um, um, why do you refuse to say anything about what could the potential outcome be in the absence of? Uh, of, of randomization, why can't you just assume that they would be the same based on your model? Uh, isn't uh, theory here to guide us of what, what, what may be the important factor that affect an outcome or another? And then if we have the model, then we can just go about, you know, put it on data and estimate it. Um, and in, in addition, a lot of factors we might be interested in, the big things, say institution, the rule of law, microeconomic stability, you name it, maybe things that are very difficult to manipulate in our cities. So maybe uh, A, you're doing something that's kind of unnecessary to get sort of some sort of experimental purity. And in the other hand, by doing that, you are just confining yourself to watch, to look for your keys under the, under the, um, the light of the, of the lamppost but the, the reality is that the important stuff is all around us in the world and you're just pre prevent, pre not looking at it. So maybe we're confining ourselves with this kind of method to, to the small things that are unlikely to make a major difference in practice. And in addition, maybe you stifle innovation by requiring that before you know something, you need an RCT and you need to prove the causal effects and things like that. <coughs> so I could spend most of my time worrying about why bother, but I'm going to spend very little time of it, on it because if it, if it had been 15 years ago when this started, I could have spent a lot of time on this. But now I'm going to spend very little time on this, just enough to keep you with me for the rest of the talk, hopefully. I think the only thing I want to say is that what is not in our model, models 
and will never be in our models, in my view, it's not a matter of time, it's just never gonna happen, is, uh, is that details are incredibly important and uh, intuition does not help us resolving those details. It's like you have the real world kind of comes in and you have no idea. For example, you know that maybe teachers, you know, more, more teachers in a classroom might be better than fewer, but by how much? There's no, no model is going to tell you that until you, try the, until you try the data. More generally even, so I'll give you an example. So for example, you can say, well, education is clearly important in ensuring economic growth. So people have been running regression, trying to show whether countries that are more educated, more educated people are, have a higher uh, GDP or not. Um, first of all, they're not even sure what's the answer to that question. But even if you did, like once you've done that, what have you done? Like education is what? It's like it's a bunch of things. The quality might vary widely. The way it is organized vary widely. So once you've said education is important, you've said nothing of practical value to anybody who wants to address this problem. Because you need to get into the details and thinking how the classes need to be organized. Should it be private? Should it be public? Combination of both, et cetera. So I'll give you one example about democracy. So okay, let's assume we all agree that democracy is important. Uh, we can agree on that even on as a, you know, a philosophical matter, whatever the impact is on growth, because we think it's important for people to choose. But democracy is complicated. You know, it's a way of elections are organized. It's going to have a, an impact potentially. And what I want to persuade you with using a non-RCT example on purpose <laughs> uh, is that the details of the rules make a huge difference on the final outcome of what we call democracy. And these examples come for, from uh, Brazil and looking at the uh, uh, change in electoral rules. And it's a very nice paper by uh, uh, Thomas Fujiwara, who, is, who teaches uh, political science, uh, sorry, economics at, uh, at Princeton, but works on political economy issues. So in Brazil, uh, they used to have a whole old system where people used to have to uh, write down uh, whoever they wanted to vote for. So that's for the right. So first of all, you see, they are trying to vote for two elections on the same ballot. If it reminds you of the butterfly, ba butterfly ballot, is that you are less young than you, than you look. Uh, so there are two things, that, yeah, two parts of the ballot. Then one part, you need to check a number. But the other part, there are actually so many candidates that they cannot give you a list. You have to write down with your best handwriting the name of whoever you want to vote for. If, there, if you, by chance, you cannot read, you cannot write, or you make a mistake, uh, the, the ballot is invalid. So there was a huge, like a fairly large number of invalid ballots. I'm going to show you how many in a minute. And then they switched to that system where instead of um, um, writing down the number, you need to punch a number. And once you punch the number, the, the face of the person you want to vote for shows up and his name, etc. so you can make sure you have voted for the right person. You can continue only if you want to. <coughs> they did this change because it would be much faster to count the votes. But the unintended effect is that it uh, really reduced the number of uh, invalid ballots. You can see it in this graph. Uh, in green here, you have the uh, 94 uh, election result, uh, the, number of, uh, uh, the, the number of vote, the number of valid vote. In blue, uh, you have the number of valid vote in the 98 election, and in red, the, num uh, the number of valid ballots in the 2002 election. And you can see that something clearly happens around uh, the city size of uh, $40,000 in 40,000 people in 1996. So why is that 40,000 uh, line relevant? It's because they introduced the reform in two phases. In phase one, they only had it for the large cities, 40,000 and larger. And in phase two, everybody got brought in. So you can see that before anybody got it, you have uh, a very fra large fraction of votes that get uh, invalidated. Then when the big cities get uh, introduced, you have a big increase in the number of valid votes in the big cities, right at the threshold. Uh, and then when everybody gets brought in, then the, the, the number of valid votes increases everywhere. So that makes a big difference for how democracy is uh, actually implemented. Of course, the type of people who tend to make mistakes are the people who make uh, 
who, who are not necessarily literate, etc. So it actually changes the fraction. It actually changes the composition of people who actually end up voting. And therefore, it changes who gets elected, and it changes what they do. So in fact, it continues to follow up you know, sort of pro-poor policies. And he sees that as in, in places where more of the cities were in, a, in an area where under the new system, you get more pro-poor policy be implemented. So it shows that details like that are extremely important. And details like that are actually what we are very well placed off to look at, uh, to look at with our cities. So a lot of my work, actually, especially lately, you could say is about plumbing. It's about less like what is like a great idea that you can have and more about how do you go about implementing it. So, and that means that often I work with governments who are already something that they want to do anyway. And it's all about how do you get it done? Like what's the way in which get, you know, if, you, if the money, how will the money goes from point A to point Z where it needs to go without being lost in the middle, this type of stuff. Uh, so uh, JPAL, which is the, the, the network I helped uh, started, uh, basically helps people running RCTs. So we have about 130 or so affiliates around the world. And together, they have either completed or are working on 700 randomized, control, 700 randomized control trials in 64 countries in a lot of sectors. That's why I don't want to spend you to spend too much time, convince you that it's feasible and it's potentially interesting. It has, it has happened anyway. That train has left the station. So what I want to do is to, is to, uh, is to tell you, you know, after 15 years, like what, what are some key questions that, that are in my mind uh, and the extent to which we have answers to, to those questions. So one key question is whether results generalize from context to context. Actually, we had this question from day one, but now we have some elements of answer to this question. You could say, well, you know, if I would do an experiment here, but I'm learning something that is completely local to that place, that might still be relevant to them, but there's no, it's not, there's no public good involved and there is no science involved because, uh, you know, that still, as they could still decide to do it. After all, firms do like this A-B testing, but uh, it's not, it, it would be less interesting. So what we are able to do now is to, is to do the same, to try and evaluate the same program in different places at the same time. Uh, and that gives you a sense of whether you get different results in different settings. So I'm going to briefly give you two examples of that. One is a very complex program called the Ultra Poor Program, which was started by a Bangladeshi NGO called BRAC. And you can see they're trying to do all sorts of stuff at the same time. It's sort of a big push approach for people who are extremely poor. Uh, they are doing, uh, they're giving them an asset, they're giving them some training, they are giving them a little stipend for a few weeks, they are keeping them, and they are meeting them every week. So it's costly. So they were <laughs> pretty interested to know whether it was working. And they launched an RCT uh, in Bangladesh, which showed pretty large effects. But then there was a question of, then would you want to replicate this type of program elsewhere, given that maybe BRAC is very special, and in addition, maybe it will work in Bangladesh, not elsewhere. So the Ford Foundation and CGAP managed to kind of assemble enough money and enough partners, NGO, and enough researchers to uh, evaluate this program in six more countries. And then we were able to publish the papers in, uh, in six, in this, in one paper, we published the six RCTs together. Uh, you don't need to look at the sort of all of the, the effect of that. You can just see that the effects tend to be, all be positive across a range of domains. On average, this is the average effect, just a simple average effect, one person, one, one data point across the entire, the entire sample. Uh, all of these are RCTs. Uh, so it's a good program. But more importantly, when you're looking at the different countries, you can see that the effects are positive in most countries. A big exception in the middle here is Honduras. Uh, this is the effect on assets, so how much productive assets the, the poor are after, have after three years. The program lasts for a year, but three years later they were surveyed for the last time. Actually, in India, we continue to follow them. You can see large changes in assets. This is in standard deviation, so an average of 0.2 and then uh, and same thing for consumption. In all the countries, you see large increase in, large increase in consumption, except in Honduras. So one country was different. Uh, 
I'm not going to explain to you why, unless you ask later, because at some level, ex post, you can make all sorts of <laughs> uh, story why uh, something happened. Uh, the bottom line is that the, the, the variation is not all that great, given that this has a completely different context. Second example is microcredit. So if you were following microcredit in the 2000s, this is 2006 is when Mohamed Yunus uh, wins the Nobel Prize. In fact, 2003 is when he was in this very room uh, being uh, 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 with MIT students really uh, uh, fascinated by him, rightly. Uh, by oops, uh, 2013, uh, the, 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 the pendulum had swung like widely. Uh, it was like uh, is Grameen founder, uh, uh, Mohamed Yunus, a bloodsucker of the poor? Uh, India's microfinance suicide epidemic, et cetera, et cetera. Both level of both excitement on uh, both sides uh, happened in the, in the absence of any really hard evidence. So towards the end of this period, though, we had started to try to, to, to we had started to finally succeed to convince enough microfinance partners to run randomized control trial of the impact. And uh, there were seven evaluations conduct by, conducted by several teams with one of two design. One was this, this like in the bubble randomization, as I described. The other was uh, just a clustered randomized trials where uh, you randomize at the level of the village or the neighborhood, whether the, inform the MFI is going to enter or not. And uh, one of the first evaluations to come out was India, which showed really no impact. And at the beginning, like, it was completely dismissed as being sort of just this one place and it would be different elsewhere, etc. So we sort of left it aside and let the other study co come. And when they all came together, I was able to publish them all together into one, journal, one issue of a journal. In this case, we didn't publish one paper, but at least we put them all together into one journal. And uh, something interesting you can do when you start having more than one study is putting them all together. In a, and try to do some, you know, aggregate them in some way. So MIT uh, econ PhD student Rachel Minger has used the uh, Bayesian hierarchical modeling to look at how, what does this, what do this different study are trying to tell us? Are they trying to all tell us the same thing? Are they all trying to tell us that it could go all over the place? And what she found in this case is actually remarkable pooling of all of the estimates around zero. So it's not that we get zero because each of them have very, you know, a huge standard error and it's not very interesting. They're all trying to be exactly zero. So when they pull, or they're close to zero. So when you, uh, when you, when you uh, use them all together, you really reduce the, the, the noise of each of them. And you're getting this nice neat zero around profit and nice neat very close to zero around consumption. And uh, you can see even visually that uh, the, the, the pooling factor is going to be high, that these studies are, are pretty much uh, all right on the money in terms of saying that, well, it doesn't really work all that much. What is interesting, though, that she's looking at now is that you can also look at whether microcredits increases not only the mean, say, of profit, but the variability of profit. Maybe the zero is made of some people succeeding widely and some people completely failing. And what she finds for variability is large effect and effect that actually are very diverse from one side to the other. So it is not like it's not a theorem that everything has to be the same. It is it happens to be the same for consumption and profit in, in, on average, but it seems to be quite different for the variance. So it's it's hierarchical, it seems like it's mixture or yes, exactly. It's come from a, you assume that there is a parent distribution where the effect is coming from, and then so you're pulling from the parent distribution and it has a try to estimate both what's the mean and the, and the standardization from the parent distribution. Um, so it's, it, and the prior she imposes is very, very weak. So it is more of a <coughs> sort of a computation device as opposed to having strong philosophical underpinning that. Uh, um, a second question is, uh, uh, so this is just starting because there, until uh, recently there weren't that many sort of several evolution of the same thing, but there are more and more. So one could multiply those, uh, those, those type of analysis, trying to understand in which context we have a lot of variability, in which context we don't. Um, another question you could ask is, well, suppose that uh, 
that in fact you were able to 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 learn something from from a study and you wanted to implement it as a policy would you be able to do that you know when you when you run a, one of these studies typically not a too large sample just large enough to get enough power with a good partner etc once this becomes a policy where the sample become much much larger and it's not your trusted partner that implements, but the government, or even a firm, or a large NGO, or whatever, would that make a difference? So there are lots of constraints of, from extrapolating from one nicely done experiment to a policy. One is that the effect might be different in a small program and in a large program. In uh, economics uh, jargon, we call that general equilibrium effect. For example, if you gave one, co one cow to one person, she would have one cow. But if you gave a cow to an entire district, then the price of cow would collapse. Um, so that's one potential problem. Another potential problem is, as the problem is scaled up, you may be moved, moving down the demand curve, moving down the potential effect. Like the, the first people you serve are the people who need it the most, and then the next people you serve maybe don't need it as much anymore, so the average effect is going to be lower than what you're estimating. And finally, the government might not be able to implement the policy as well as, the, as your initial partner, or might not be willing to, so you're going to get less effects than you, than you expected. Well, the only way to, to find this out is to try it out. Uh, so recently, a lot of my work has been on this very large scale because there is no way to answer large-scale questions without working at a large scale. Uh, and, and, and some people also, a lot of people try to do that. So I'll give you just one, one example of a study I did, which is trying to, to work at scale. Uh, this is a study we did in France uh, with the collaboration of the uh, um, employment agency. And we were interested in evaluating uh, something called the active labor market policy which is sort of by way of this kind of the only thing a European country really do in terms of helping the unemployed is to try and help them, uh, you know, learn how to build a resume and give some phone calls on their behalf and learn how to tie their ties and the like. And when you have randomized evaluation that have been done, the first randomized evaluation, I've seen some positive effect of doing that. At least people get a job faster when they get the program. But one big issue is whether it's purely musical chair. That Munza and I are in the same labor market, I get helped, so I get the job, but there was only one job, so he doesn't get the job. On the other hand, it could be that because I'm trained, I'm more employable, so I now have a job that would not otherwise have existed. So we don't know until we try. So what we did is that we did a design where we first randomize at the labor market level. So you have to imagine the, the, the evaluation takes place in about half of France. Uh, and half of France is left away. In the rest of France, is, uh, each labor market is assigned to one of five groups. 0% uh, treated, 200% treated. And then in each of, in 0% treated, obviously no, no one is treated. In 100%, everybody is treated. Uh, and then we vary uh, the fraction 25, 50, and 75. Uh, here, it's 100% of the eligible population for the program, which is young people who have been unemployed for a while. And so when you compare, for example, one of the little white guy in the 25% group to one of the little white guy in the 0% group, it will tell you whether he, was, he or she was hurt by the fact that uh, there was a treated person in his market. Uh, so that gives you a sense of the, uh, of the externalities. So this is simply the, the, the treatment effect, so comparing blue dot to white dot inside a city. And we reproduce what people have found. Uh, for, find no effect for women, but for men, we find that benefiting from the program makes the beneficiary 5 percentage point more likely to get a job within six months than, uh, than uh, if, they, if they didn't get the program. But when you compare, now this, this introduced, the people assigned to program, it's the same difference as before because we're comparing them to people in their area who were not assigned. So it turns out that people in their area who were not assigned to the program are hurt by about the same magnitude. So basically, it's entirely, uh, it's entirely a musical ga uh, a chair uh, game. 
Uh, and in fact, our experiment span the crisis and the non-crisis periods, especially during the crisis, it's entirely displacement. So you learn something from that that you wouldn't have been able to learn otherwise. So let's just think this is kind of unique. There have been several examples uh, of this kind of large-scale study over recent years uh, done by different teams, and we are, uh, we are learning a, a bunch from, from these studies. Uh, in particular, another type of things that people have tried doing, and I think I will skip this example because I'll give you other examples before, is trying to work with government and scale things with government and embracing all of the frustration that comes with it. Uh, I'm in the middle of a large program where we're trying to work with government. I can tell you it's a lot of frustration. Uh, but uh, you know, all of the issues that you will encounter uh, in real life, you can see them in the study, and you can kind of they become part of your treatment. Um, uh, so we've done that, for example, in a program on remedial education, where to go from the sort of proof of concept that we did to the NGO to something that can be scaled up, it took, took us like four or five RCTs, where every time we tried and failed and then try again and change slightly the program, tweak slightly the program so that it stick within the government setup. So the next question you might ask is, well, does anybody care? Is there any appetite uh, by policymakers or others, private uh, people, NGOs, et cetera, to scale up evidence from those successful uh, pilot trials? So suppose you actually you learn something from it, it is visible, but do, does, anybody, does anybody care? Uh, so we're trying to count that. Uh, so we're trying to find out the number of people who are reached by programs that uh, we have found to be effective. Note that we are not counting the number of people who don't get reached by programs that we have found ineffective, uh, which is actually also uh, useful <laughs> potentially, but it's harder to count, like how many people would have gotten microcredit uh, or not. And, and you can see that you know, it's still a fair number of people, 200 million people, uh, without counting uh, a number of stuff that I'm going to describe to you now. So how does that happen? Like, there are two ways it happens. One is that you're working, say, with a government already. They try something out, and if it works, they can scale it up for themselves. Uh, so one example of that is a program that was evaluated by Ben Olken, Abhijit Banerjee, and others. In Indonesia, we have a big office in Indonesia, and Ben Olken has a very close relationship with the government there. And uh, they, they looked at the Raskin program, which is a program by which the government distributes free rice. It's a program that is fraught with problems, uh, but whatever, it exists. One of the problems is that there is a lot of leakage. A lot of the rice doesn't get to the intended beneficiaries. Uh, and one of the reasons to do that is, uh, is so Eligible people received only about a third of what they should be receiving based on their eligibility. Uh, so the government was, was interested in knowing whether if you distributed eligible people a card which showed that they are eligible and how much they are eligible for, it would uh, increase the, 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 the entitlement that they are getting. So uh, Ben Olken, Abhijit, and, uh, and Rima Hanna, and others started to set up the experiment. And oh, because they had some interest in doing it, in you know, learning as much as possible from the program, they distributed not only one type of card, but four types of cards. Uh, one which just which explains the program and gives the price. Give the one which explains the program but didn't give the price. And one, in addition, which had these little coupons that, in principle, the the officials were supposed to clip and therefore improve the sort of the accountability behind. I'm not going to get into the details of what these various treatments did. Just to give you an example that whenever we touch something, we only try to do 55 different things at the same time. Uh, but on balance, if you compare card versus no card, the first thing is that 28, only 28% 28 of people who should have received the card did it, did so. So you could say, well, it's really terrible. But on the one hand, you know, think about Obamacare or something. The launch of it had a little bit of, uh, of uh, problems at the beginning of it. So 28%, that's you know, embracing the complexities. But despite that, uh, if you're looking at this, this card treatment uh, row here, tells you the difference between people who got the card and people who didn't get the card. And you can see that people who got the card uh, 
got on average a kilo of rice more, and they got it at uh, 60 rupees less per kilo uh, than they would than, than the people in the control group. So on average, so on balance day, they got 7,000 more subsidies uh, of um, an average of 28,000. So it's a fairly large uh, uh, increase in the subsidy from just getting this gun. So the government was pretty excited uh, about the results, and they just scaled up the program. Like, and then 65 million people now get, uh, get a card. Another way you, you can go is uh, the researchers does the experiment, and then a nice, uh, uh, fresh-faced social entrepreneur uh, runs with it and tries to replicate the study, etc. So the, here the researcher is Pascaline Dupin, who, when she was still a graduate student uh, working uh, with me, ran an experiment um, on uh, something called the Sugar Daily Program, which was trying to convince young girls that uh, uh, young boys are less likely to have HIV than older men, which uh, is pretty obvious when you think that HIV doesn't go away, so it has to be true almost by construction. Uh, but uh, 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 girls actually didn't know. Girls think, thought that the young uh, boys were more dangerous. And so she did that, and, and, she, and she, she showed that after showing this video and this training, the fraction of young girls who got pregnant by an older partner this diminished a lot which indicate probably that they, are less likely to had, they, they were less likely to have sex with them. Anyway, that, that study took place some long time ago. Eventually, this is Noam Angrest. He was an MIT student, uh, undergraduate student. He's now a Rhodes Scholar. He, uh, he, he heard about the study, learned about the study uh, uh, in, uh, uh, in my class. I, 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 I'm happy to report. And then he, uh, he was in Botswana for a while. He just... Uh, kind of started to try and replicate it, had got money to replicate it, and is now running this kind of large, large studies which are at the same time programs on the basis of this program. Uh, so his objective is not to publish anywhere. His objective is to get this like replicated and scaled up. Finally, <coughs> sort of to, to conclude, the last question you could ask is whether there is any appetite by policymakers and others to integrate marginally behind the results, in the sense what we want, if we want to be bigger than 700 randomized controlled trials, mm -hmm. is we want this culture of learning and experimentation and tweaking, et cetera, to make it, make it way in government itself. In the same way that there is a huge increase in the number of experiments that people use in, in businesses. You know, 10 years ago, very few, there was not that many randomized experiments in marketing, and now there are lots and lots and lots. And of course, Google, et cetera, uh, Amazon, uh, Facebook, I assume Uber does a lot of randomized uh, experimentation on us. But is there any appetite of the kind among policymakers? And uh, I think there is. Uh, it is usually, this is very idiosyncratic and it's really depending on the persons, but we have a number of sort of encouraging examples. I'll give you just one. Uh, I worked for uh, several years uh, with the Pollution Control Board in Gujarat. Uh, Gujarat is, uh, uh, so India is one of the most polluted places on earth. You think it's China, but it's really India. India is the most polluted cities. And Gujarat is one of the most polluted places in India. Uh, it's a very fast growing industrial state, and uh, it's, it has a, it's, it's terribly polluted. And the problem is not that they don't have policies. They have policies, they have thresholds, they have standards, but nobody really respects them. And part of the problem is the apparatus to make firms uh, accountable to this threshold that are, they are supposed to satisfy. So in Gujarat, they have two uh, ways that they do things. One is just inspecting firms, and the other is third-party environmental audits. What's an audit? An environmental audit is that the most polluting firms, depending on the sectors and the size, three times a year must pay a company to go visit them inspect them, do some pollution readings, et cetera, and prepare a report telling them how polluting they are and what they could do about it. Now, a big problem is that uh, there is a huge conflict of interest between the auditor and the firm because the auditor is paid by the firm and it is uh, uh, much simpler to give them what they are uh, asking, rather, which is a clean report, than try to give them the true report. So, when we started working with them, everybody was convinced, auditors, firms, government, that the system was useless. 
because uh, farms were uh, cheating like crazy. So uh, we worked with them. So they were in fact cheating. I'll show you an example of that. We worked with the government uh, to try something. I'll tell you what the treatment was in a minute. But here is some data. So this is what the auditors report. So you can see that this is a the red line is a threshold. So the red line says whether you're polluted or not. So the farms are doing very well. It's in fact hard to believe, looking at this picture, that there is pollution in Gujarat because the farms are all below the threshold. Uh, but what we did is we back-checked this report. So we went uh, um, soon after uh, uh, a team from a college went and took the same re uh, me measure from, from the farm. And this is what we found in the back check. So the actual distribution of uh, readings are quite different from uh, what is being reported, including here you see that uh, report, very, very low report in the back checks. And you don't see any of them in the, in, in the auditor's report. Why is that? Well, maybe even even yes. Well, it sort of looks funny that it's all benched. Well, if you're going to cheat anyway, you know, if you're going to make up the data, there's no point going and collecting the data. You might as well just sitting in your uh, in your office and report the data. In which case, you're not going to remember that zero is also an acceptable number. Number and uh, so in fact the price to get an audit a, a side effect of that for the farms is that it's very cheap an audit because nobody actually needs to do any measurement <laughs> so uh, the, the the price of an audit is actually much cheaper than the bare minimum technical need to do the to do the requirement anyway the, what did we do uh, we randomly selected some farms so you see how we had to work with the government pretty closely because they had to agree to change the rule we randomly selected some farms and uh, the government told them. Change in rule, now you're not selecting your audit. We are selecting the auditor for you. You're not paying the auditors. Uh, you're paying to a central pool. The central pool is paying the auditor. And finally, the auditors will be back checked. So that cuts the link between the auditor and the firm and also creates, so now the auditor is responsible to the pool, therefore to society and not to the firm. And in addition, you make them accountable by measuring them. Bribery under those circumstances? Oh, there are perverse incentives for bribery either way. Right. But the advantage of the system, that's why you need the back checks, because otherwise the, the auditor is not directly responsible for, to the firm, but if they are not responsible to anybody, they could, uh, they, there is no, they, they could still cheat. But here, if we find them cheating, then we kick them out of the pool. Uh, and so what we're finding is that, so this is the treatment. Uh, in the, this is what is on the top panel is what the auditors report. The bottom panel is the back checks. And you can see that they are pretty uh, nicely aligned. The back checks have no way, the back checkers do not talk to the auditors. So there is no bribery there. So it worked pretty well. And then in fact, it created something useful. The, you can see this is the actual reduction in pollution by the firm. Uh, so uh, especially among the very highly polluter, we had a reduction in pollution. And so the consequence is that the Gujarat Pollution Control Board accepted and enforced uh, our three main recommendations. So they've sort of changed the law. So it's a bit complicated, but they managed to do that. So randomized trial has dramatically increased in numbers, in scale, in scope, the type of things you can do. I would never have guessed we could do anything remotely <laughs> resembling that like 10 years ago when we were randomizing flip charts in schools, like it was. Uh, they are now starting to play some role in the policy conversation. It's never going to be all of it, nor should it be. Uh, but I think they have helped provide some focus on what we know, some focus on what we don't know, and some focus on what we need to find out, which hopefully is going to generate lots, of, lots more work in the years to come. Thank you very much. How expensive is a useful trial? And is it, that a problem for you to be able to conduct work with governments especially? It really depends <laughs> from trial to trial. So because it depends on how you're going to collect the data, whether it's you need a very large sample, whether people are all close together. So there is a wide range. I would say the mode is uh, $200,000 uh, to, to get uh, uh, 
to get uh, um, for, for the majority of things. Uh, is it a problem? Well, it's always a problem. Mormon is always better than other, but it's not been a huge limit, limit, limiting factor to date because some people have been willing to, to pay for it. Um, in fact, in recently, even governments are starting to be willing to pay for it themselves. Uh, so, and before that, uh, donors were like, you know, sort of interested, and there are, there are some agencies who, who, are, who are interested in funding those because it, 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 general, it generates knowledge. They're not too much more expensive than any other data collection exercise because usually the, usually the implementation costs are covered by the partner anyway. Uh, but of course, it's, it's a data collection exercise. What, what I've observed working with commercial organizations and a couple of NGOs is there's an evangelistic aspect. They want the hypothesis to test true. They want their initiative that's funded to be valid. So there's a behavioral economics component, and if the experiment doesn't deliver the results they want, you have not done the right experiment. You've, you've screwed up. I'm wondering how often that phenomenon has occurred or whether you've seen a different distribution in the response to that over the last decade if you're doing these experiments, RCTs all over the world. So it's, it's, it's possible, but it's not as bad as you would suspe suspect, uh, partly because there is some selection in who agrees to participate to an experiment. And for example, in R for microcredit, it took us a very long time to persuade seven, seven organizations to do it, because they were so convinced that they were doing God's work that they had no interest in evaluating the thing. Usually when people agree to evaluate a program, it's because they have some questions that they ask themselves. Uh, and I've been uh, very diligently staying away from flagship programs by governments, at least from evaluating the programs themselves. Uh, a sample. Well, of, of things that where people are interested in the answers. Uh, two th things that help is that because we are at MIT and other people who are in other academic institutions, we will never sign uh, an agreement where we will, the result will be uh, have to be uh, checked before we can release. We, we, we always hide behind MIT and say, we are not even allowed to do that, sorry. Another thing is uh, we are pushing very hard for registering trials, not only ours, but elsewhere. So I started a registry on behalf of the American Economic Association. Mm -hmm. So as soon as we start a trial, it's registered, so its existence is known. So if the result never come out, then there is some, you know, someone can ask and say, what's, what's happening to your trial? Um, and then try to write down a little bit what we expect. What it, where it poses problems is people are so optimistic about the effect they're going to have that they typically push for underpowering the trials. Because if you think the effects are going to be used, you can go with small sample because you're going to be able to have good powers anyway. And you're like, are you really sure? Like, do you want to really test for an effect that large? Because if it's a little smaller, we won't be able to set the difference from zero. So you need a lot of negotiation ex ante to have a, a trial that's large enough. Microfinance would be an example of, of that. How upset were some of the people? Uh, tremendously upset. Uh, as in, tremendously upset. But, uh, so it took some time, and in a sense, the first study that came out from India got nowhere, right. except for upsetting them. But then when you have seven of them, then eventually, you know, it's what it is. So in fact, uh, here, uh, CGAP, which is an international body that is in charge of promoting microfinance, they very aptly kind of pivoted. They organized a whole like conference with us and with microfinance partner. And, and now they are like, you know, just, just broaden their mission, broader their mandate. They're about financial inclusion for the poor that goes from uh, ultra poor till uh, m -Pesa and stuff like that. So it, in, it includes successful products at both ends and, uh, and, and everything is fine. But some of the microfinance agencies are still upset. Uh, I, I don't think uh, Mohamed Yunus is talking to me anytime. time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the five o'clock. We do have a reception in the, at the sixth floor in the last hour, so join us with us.